Thank you. Uh, do you mind if we publish? We typically publish our stuff on YouTube. Do you mind if we do that? No, I, I love the transparency. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, it kind of seemed like you were you were pretty transparent from what I see about you. It's pretty cool. Great. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, keep going. Keep going. But would it be helpful if I started over? Do you want me to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So in the United States, there's two organizations that credential um, employers and schools, and that's the Department of Education and then the Department of Labor. And so uh, from what I've gathered from your website, um, you already have an apprenticeship, and so in theory that could potentially fall into the Department of Labor's credentialing program. What that would look like is a national, uh, nationally recognized certificate uh, of an apprentice um, that is exportable to other employers and uh, could potentially you know, result in college credit. Um, and then that is the pathway to GI Bill certification. Is that um, the employer route or is that education route, the department? Employer. Employer route. Employer. How is it an employer if you're an apprentice? In I'm sorry, say again? How is it um, the apprentice considered employment? Uh, the Department of Labor defines apprentice as somebody who works at least 30 hours a week, um, is on a, what they call a uh, work, pro uh, I think it's a work process, or in other words, training schedule. Um, and they're earning an hourly wage that's at least 50% of what the employer considers to be fully qualified for the position that they're training. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the employer side. As an educational institution, uh, you would apply through the Department of Education, and then that would be your, your um, gateway into the GI Bill. So just to summarize, if I'm a soldier leaving the military and I want to use my GI Bill, I have three options. I can use it for education. I can use it for on-the-job training, um, which is typically shorter and less restrictive than an apprenticeship, or mm -hmm. I can use it for a full-fledged apprenticeship. Um, if I use it for education, then the government's going to pay tuition uh, up to a certain amount um, for most non-graduate schools that typically covers full tuition, room and board. Um, Sorry, tuition, room they're gonna, and board, or just tuition? Correct. Uh, it, it depends what the total amount is and what the program is. Um, but, and it also depends on if the school, uh, in quotation marks, includes in their total tuition room and board. Okay. Um, and so I think the, the nuances of this, um, I have to get back to you on specifically how that would apply to an organization like yours, but um, in theory, it could cover all of it. Okay. Okay. Um, that's how we're. That's how we're doing it right now. Is room and board, and the tuition is the same. Okay, great. Yeah, and um, has uh, OSC been around for at least two years, running the apprenticeship? Um, not running the apprenticeship. This is the first first apprenticeship, but as an organization, we've been around for a decade. Okay. Okay. Um, typically, they want to see some track record of success to make sure that, like, you know, as a uh, risk mitigation against, you know, mm -hmm. exploitive, right? Um, so, so, anyways, from the, from the veterans' perspective, the government pays them, pays you, the, the, the school, the tuition, on behalf of the student. They also give the student a monthly housing allowance, which is just cash paid to them monthly. Um, and it's based on the zip code. So like Austin, Texas, it's something like $1,900 a month on top of um, the tuition. Um, I, I have only dealt personally with employers seeking national apprenticeship registration. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think at some point it may be worth uh, me just giving you a little bit of my background and the context that um, I'm coming from just because I, I want to be as transparent as possible about my limitations as well as like a small business owner. And I'd like um, to ask you also before you go in, if you can, so is this your full-time work and how did you, I saw your video, that's great stuff, maybe share a little more about how you got motivated to do this? Both yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, so uh, I got my undergraduate in mechanical engineering and then I did eight years in the army as an infantry officer. 
um, my exit from the military, I, I was injured and I had about an 18 month recovery process, which was essentially graduate school uh, for military transition. Um, I was placed in something called a warrior transition unit, which is your full time job is recovery and transition. And I, I got real deep into the red tape, saw the costs uh, or, or the impact it was having on particularly younger soldiers who didn't have a college degree, who didn't have as much life experience, and frankly didn't have a support network. And at the time, I was very focused on sort of climbing the achievement ladder. And so I decided to go to grad school. I was interested in professional services because that's what I thought success meant. And I was in a club meeting for to recruit for consulting my first semester of grad school. And one of my former soldiers committed suicide, and I received a notification. And so the next week, you know, uh, I, I'm in the meeting, I get the call, and then a couple days later, I'm at the funeral, and it ends up being this this reunion with the platoon I served with in Afghanistan. And uh, I decided then and there that seeing them struggle and knowing what I uh, what my experience was with them as the, some of the most capable humans I've ever met. I realized that there's, you know, structural issues with uh, how they're being uh, transitioned. And then when I reflected on my own service, the most rewarding part of it was the human part, the, the helping people realize their potential and, 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 and empowering them and making them feel like they have agency in the world and, 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 and pushing against sort of the institutionalization that happens when you take an 18-year-old, you condition them for blind obedience and mm -hmm. then kick them out into the world. And so I came back to grad school and I immediately pivoted to entrepreneurship, started this. This is my full time gig. Um, we're a mission driven for profit company. And, and what that means is that I have a business model. Uh, I can walk you through how I, in theory, make money, but I don't charge employers or veterans unless certain conditions are met. So, for example, I won't charge a veteran unless they're financially better off than they were when they were yeah. full time active duty. I won't charge them unless they have emergency savings for at least three months and some other criteria. I don't charge employers until they become certified. And I don't charge them until they're satisfied with the match that I create with the veteran. Um, and at the end of the day, like just full transparency, I'm here to solve the problem. If I can earn a living doing that as well, great. If not, I'm not going to let the profit motive stand in the way of me doing that. Um, right. I'm, I'm married. I have... Yeah, go ahead. What is, what is your typical charge for uh, for the matchmaking? How do you uh, the matchmaking is tw yeah twenty five percent of the payroll savings that the employer realizes. So, uh, I get an employer certified. That enables them to pay an entry level employee uh, less than they would if they just went off the street and tried to hire somebody who's fully qualified. And the veteran is receiving that money directly from the government and so there's a surplus there of money that is um essentially the, the payroll savings on the employer side and so at the end of their training program we say okay this is how much money you saved on payroll relative to if you had to hire somebody off the street who wasn't receiving this additional housing loan i take 25 percent of that value and then you realize the the 75 percent of the savings um, over a two-year period, just orders of magnitude, um, a concrete installer who I built their training program for them, um, it's two years long. Uh, the total uh, price that they're going to pay at the end of that is something like six grand. And it's it, it covers that, you know, that that's roughly 25% of their savings they experience over that two years. Um, I have a question, John or Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. John's when, fine. Yeah. John, um, having kind of read o about OSC and kind of understanding everything that you do, what was your sense of uh, starting off point for us? Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's first and foremost um, it, choosing which path you think is the most appropriate: education or employment. Um, I think that's probably a little bit deeper conversation. And then once we decide which path, uh, if it's uh, employment, it's going to be um, identify the what we're going to call the work process. 
um, develop a wage schedule, um, and essentially map out what the two year or six month or however long you want the apprenticeship to last, ideally. Okay. Map that out in terms of benchmarks. And then we submit an application, and then it's an iterative process with the Department of Labor um, to uh, you know address their concerns and, and, and fix. And my experience thus far with the Department of Labor is that they're trying to work with you to make sure that your you know your your goals match the intent of the apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. Now, that contrasts with if you work directly with the VA, and this is something I, I uh, didn't get to earlier, but you can also pursue something called on-the-job training certification directly through the VA. The end result for the employer is the same in the sense that the veterans they hire uh, would still receive the same GI Bill benefit um, as an on-the-job trainee instead of an apprentice. The difference is the pathway to get there, and once um, a veteran completes your program, on-the-job training program, it won't carry the same credentialing weight that an apprenticeship would. Um, and in my experience, dealing with the VA is much more cumbersome. Um, their focus is primarily healthcare, and so this is sort of a secondary piece of business for them, and they don't mm -hmm. talk or work very well with the Department of Labor. So it's it's very classic bureaucratic red tape type of thing. Yeah. Okay, um, maybe I'll just share one thing that the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Jesse's hooked us up with Dean Truman in the engineering school. Um, so the, I do think that like having that deep conversation around labor versus education is something that we'll need to think through soon. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the phenomenal thing about what you're offering is the bottom line to a veteran who's young, who's separated, who doesn't know what, what they want to do with their life, is that you're saying, like, just move out here. We'll, we'll pay your room and board. We'll teach you. You'll join immediately join a community. And the reason that's important is because what uh, in the sea of goodwill we aim at veterans, there's that, that income piece and how am I going to cover my bills piece that is missing from a lot of people when they think about education. And so I think that mm. you're in this space that is really beautiful in terms of being an opportunity um, in which you answer that question directly for the veteran of like, how am I going to survive while I'm doing that? Like, we have that taken care of. We just need you to show up with the right attitude. Right? Meaning, and yeah, meaning you have the pace and we have the space and program. Right, and they're not going to starve, and they don't have to, you know, figure out rent, and they, you know, um, awesome. just yeah. based on the GI for all of it. I'm sorry, say again. The GI bill doesn't pay for all of it. It could, it could. It depends on how you structure the program, um, and and again, I think it going down the education pathway. I would have to do more research and get back to you. But uh, you know, if it were structured just like a trade school. Um, okay. Um, there is a potential there. Education. When you say education, do you mean like a trade school, or you mean more like a college, or either? Um, for, from the GI Bill perspective, they're the same. They're the same. Okay. Okay. So based on the beautiful package you described, what do you think, just offhand, would meet that that goal, like right away? If we're also a nonprofit, but we're, we try to operate as in boots. We're, we're not on grants or anything. We're bootstrapped. We are programmatic revenues through workshops and product sales. Uh, would we have to incorporate a for-profit thing outside of that? I, I don't think so. Um, that's a great question for me to pass along. But we already do from a cyber perspective. Because yeah, Jesse, we're, we're going to have both, essentially. Yeah, we're going to have okay. both. But, I mean, since we've been, so I always identify this, if I want to change the world, I do that through education. I don't do that by putting people into regular jobs. I, I do that by creating a new infrastructure for how jobs and meaning is created. Based on that, what do you think, um, business or edu? Um, I would start with education. I, I think you're going to run into the problem of uh, you haven't met the two-year criteria, 
but you know, you, you're already plugged into the university system there. Um, I'm developing some some contacts um, at the VA and Department of Labor at the moment that like maybe this is a conversation we can have mm-hmm. um, where this is an exception to the rule because of your your decade long history plus what you're offering for a very reasonable tuition. Um, and so, it, you know, I think stay true to your values first. If the, the time barrier becomes an issue, I don't know that the apprenticeship pathway is going to be um, uh, compromising in any way from, from your vision, um, simply because uh, you're still empowering people with skills and, you know, an income just happens to be something that is going to solve an, a short-term problem. But how do we take it to the next level? So combine that, this is trade plus enterprise. So I don't want to be putting out workers, employees. I want to be putting out entrepreneurs into the world. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you have a selection process for very specific veterans. Um, and I mean, like, if we're just talking about the veteran community, um, I think you have a, a, a very competitive selection process uh, to mitigate that risk. I think that um, the, that your actions through the existing program speak for itself to achieving the intent that you just you mapped out. Like we're not just creating workers here; we're creating entrepreneurs, like like people who are going to take skills and solve problems at the community level. Um, that's a special human being, it is, you know, even within the veteran community. And I'm wondering if it's because because you know we can water it down. I mean, water it down. You can say. But ideally, we, we say we're creating movement entrepreneurs. I mean, this is a lofty vision, creating movement entrepreneurs that focus on solving pressing world issues. It's along the idea that it's 99, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. We all, have, we all know what to do. It's just, it takes bodies and people who can have the perseverance to do it. And that's the kind of client <laughs> we want. Now, maybe... You know, I, I call out for a lot on that, and that's kind of what I aim for in this, uh, what we aim for in the, in the whole program. The reality might be different. It, it, you know, world transformation takes a bit of time. And if we go on that only, we don't have enough people. So do you think we'd find enough people? Um, I, I am like constantly surprised at what I find. Let's say a call. I'm sorry, say it. Let's say a first cohort, I'd like to have a cohort of 24 in initial class. And what would be the quickest route to get there? The quickest route would definitely be Department of Labor um, and uh, and building an apprenticeship. Um, And and one comment on that, uh, John, is about the two years. I don't know if he's representing himself well enough in terms of what he's done and how many people he's taught, you know, through different time periods over the last 10 years. I know that there's a lot of people that have learned, are learning from March and not just these nine people that are there right now. So I think we could string together a narrative that could satisfy the two year thing. I don't know if you feel similarly Martian. Yeah, I do. I mean, you. I, I could there's, definitely, yeah. This I is could. not the only group that you've taught. No, you can't. I think you're misrepresenting what you've done. Each workshop is a learning experience where it's, it's, um, so for example, when we r- build a house or when we build a brick press or a tractor, it's an immersion experience where you learn practical skills. So people walk out, the reviews are, I mean, the people who, who take the full weight of this out of the program is, yeah, I mean, they're, they're blown away by the fact that they can build things. And it's a transformative thing to one's psychology. So I think we've changed, a no- I don't have exact numbers, but we've changed a number of people uh, to think that way, that they can actually do anything. And it's somewhat represented in a TED talk a little bit, but not really. But definitely there's been people who, I don't know the numbers, but, but people who who've shifted their mind fundamentally. Yeah, I, I, I think that the three of us right now are thinking much harder about um, the extent, the, the credibility of your organization than any bureaucrat at the Department of Labor will. And so what that means is that as long as we can communicate with the right people, mm-hmm. um, we'll be able to tell that story and we'll satisfy their concerns. 
uh, all of these, you know, requirements that I'm talking about are, are simply the baseline standards to get somebody to take your application from one pile to the other. Yeah. Um, I so, like I like this a lot. I like going the, the labor route than education route because the bureaucracy and the UMKC, they're so unpredictable. I mean, and you want to find the right people. Like, not everyone wants to be unjobbed. Well, but hold on. You said the UMKC, but this is now OSC becoming that so-called bureaucracy, which we'll uh, work on being the least of, right? So it's a little different than what you're saying. Well, I meant UMKC has a provost and, you know, state, you know, all this. I don't know. In my experience, I just, um, I think that we'll just have to wait and see how that conversation goes but i like the labor seems to be like direct to i don't know I'm, I'm i'm i know very little from this conversation but basically what you're saying is the labor is the apprenticeship we could package it and do everything that we want and we don't need the university essentially yeah but why, right. why are we but hold on a second why are we needing the university aren't we talking about osc gaining that that certification to be that entity which gives this credit? Oh, on the education one? Yeah. I I was, uh, I don't know. I think if you partner with the university, you could probably do it very quickly um, because they're probably already set up, but they're going to take out of the chunk of the... So, so John, so what's your, what's your take on it? Because my impression was that we're actually getting certified like as we get to accept the GI Bill, we're getting, as OSC, we're getting certified to have that, to build that capacity into the organization here, right? Or are we still partnering with some other degree granting institution? No, you're, you're correct. If it, it would be OSC yeah. is a GI Bill certified institution. Yeah. And so uh, as a veteran, I, I can, that just becomes one of the places on the list of options where I can use my GI. Um, now, I, to, to clarify, the quickest route from this meeting forward is to meet is for me to immediately call my contact with the Department of Labor and and start the application process, and then we would have to go through a putting your curriculum on paper, and I could send you an exam. And it the the um, v variance is extremely wide on what they accept, depending mm -hmm. on who who you talk to. Um, to, to achieve your vision as OSC as a strictly educational place, I don't see any reason I can't concurrently, you know, do some research and get better answers for you on how to apply and, and who the contacts are. Um, and I will be the first person to tell you if this is outside my capability and you should talk to somebody else. Um, I, I believe in what you do, and so I'm going to figure out a way to support that no matter what. Um, yeah, and, and, and like I think if Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Just finish that. Finish yeah, that. and so, you know, at the end of the day, the 30,000-foot view here is you want to be able to incentivize. You want to tap into the veteran talent pool. One way to do that is to have the GI Bill incentive. Um, and so from their perspective, your ability to select the right talent from the veteran pool doesn't really matter to them if it's education or apprentice. If the end state is that you know their basic needs are met, they're learning a skill, and there's some structure to their life as they do the service. We can do that. The question is, my question really is, what happens afterwards? Because I'd like to see uh, the persistent problem with OSE scaling has been talent pool, and every business says yeah. that, right? Um, so I don't think we're any unique on that. But because we're uh, core to our mission is transformation. I actually think we are justified to say that that our problem is even greater on this front. So for this reason, that's why we're approaching it. Okay, the people that we want to hire do not exist. We're going to train them. Just like, so the tractor broke, and you know, I had to build it myself. Stuff like that. We're going to have to create that infrastructure that we need to for the transformative work. So I'm looking at it as OSC would be the the entity. So OSC as a distributed global organization is the employee. Um, the employer of sorts it's the but I would actually aim to I mean do you see any issues with 
striving to to create a network where it's it's uh, it's not the traditional employer. It's a, it's a person who's got much more stake in a game, and it's a more distributed thing. It's not a McDonald's franchise. It's a thing where OSC provides an infrastructure for thriving. So that's like the business back end training, open source equipment, all the support, marketing, know how, all that 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 uh, can provide for supporting a lot of people to do this work. Um, so can that happen here? So so can we structure this this way that we're going towards? Yeah, we're actually we're going to create many many so called jobs around the world, but it's, they're going to be more uh, ideally more independent. It's not like you're, you're getting a paycheck. You basically decide what you want to do. You're you're kind of like your own boss, really. I would say somewhat like uh, general contractor kind of thing. Yeah, kind of, but it's it's more like a, the person who's incentive incentivized. Uh, they kind of control their pay because they they set their own schedule and work uh, how much they want to work really kind of, I mean I don't want to compare it to like MLM stuff like multi-level marketing thing but where you're actually going door to door and it's up to you how motivated you are to do it so set up a, an infrastructure where, where the individuals they're incentivized with things like continuous product development from OSC and a ongoing training that you can keep rising so you're buying into a lifestyle of lifelong learning it's not a job a job is typically you go you go to a certain place kind of and up there as a factory worker none of this that's a that's a one of the crimes against humanity today I would say uh, you got to keep rising and th that's why I envision OSE being uh, that kind of entity and, and so people like the expectation is just we got to shift the mindsets to people thinking a little different about their position in the in this world that they're actually the creators of it um so so once again with that said education or labor anything i mean any anyone that works but whatever's got the least friction and achieves the goals yeah it, it. Well, a lot to address there. Uh, start start with labor because that's the door that's currently open to you yeah. for sure right okay. now. Uh, I'll I'll do research into education and because there's no reason you can't. It sounds like potentially do both. Or, but again, the impact to your ability to incentivize people to apply is is the same regardless. Um, in terms of your vision, okay. So so what the GIVL is going to do is it's only really applying to the period from when they show up to when they complete your training program mm -hmm. or your as you're calling it now your apprenticeship everything beyond that is completely up to you yeah in terms of and your relationship with that employee so like at a certain point they're yeah. going to graduate and then you know you either selected the right person or you didn't and you know the, the question is going to be whether or not they're going to leave with a certificate that's recognized by the Department of Education or a certificate that's recognized by the Department of Labor, mm -hmm. which each potentially have implications. But like, the, I think I'm in good company when I say that let's not overstate the value of credentials here. Like, that's not the point. The, the point is to get the right people, and it just so happens that a certain portion may be locked into this veteran community that's really hard to reach. Um, yeah, so, so I, I don't know if I answered your concerns there, but the way I see it, really all we're talking about here is expanding the funnel for you mm -hmm. at, in terms of who you can capture. Um, meeting veterans where they are is a unique service that I provide, but yeah. we'll, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, everything else is unimpacted by, by this uh, you okay, know, work that, that we do. So, um, so how about the part where, okay, so say it's about the CD go home, um, specific product here so on the job training would be so part of the apprenticeship would be we can do things like real builds in a community so that's that's completely oh clean. yeah absolutely I mean to give you context I've built apprenticeship programs for a strength and conditioning gym a franchise mm -hmm. gym that trains their own coaches mm -hmm. right the, yeah. the, the, so, so much of my job you know on a day-to-day -day basis is taking you know big figures like yourself and translating your vision into bureaucrat language Love it. so they can just stamp it and pass it on yeah that's the kind of support we could use and right, okay. so can you how do we get the curriculum on paper because right now we've got tons and thousands of pages of notes cad files etc yeah. we need to organize that 
into what's known as a yeah. curriculum. <laughs> Who does that? Oh, I, I, it's a service I provide as well. It starts with a conversation like this, and Brian, you know, you may be familiar with this uh, from business school, but it's essentially MISI, mutually exclusive, completely exhaustive. We just need to create buckets of things that you do. So it could be like, you know, um, you know, first principles like physics, mm -hmm. uh, dynamics, that kind of thing, material science. Um, it, and then it could be fabrication is another bucket and field testing, oh, yeah. QA, right. And then once we have those buckets, then we start going down into the next uh, level of like, here's a list of tasks we know you need to be proficient in. Mm -hmm. right? we, we know you okay. need to understand eye protection, ear protection, like basic safety. So I think you could figure out where I'm going with this. Um, once that's done, we assign a, a rough hour allocation to it okay. of what you think. This is all theoretical. It's all guess. And then you decide, is this a competency-based program or is this something where I need somebody to lay a thousand welds before I would feel comfortable with um, representing OSE mm -hmm. uh, in the future, right? Um, and so th th those are the big rocks, right? Um, it, you know, down the labor you know, category, the, the wage schedule is another big component that, that employers um, need to think hard about because what, what it means is that you know, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a traditional employer and say, like, well, a, a graduate of OSC is potentially worth $30 an hour, let's say. That means that on day one, I can't pay a green apprentice any less than 50% of that. So, that, mm -hmm. so I figured out my floor. I figured out the target I'm going to. Now, over this training period, i got to figure out at what point I'm going to escalate, if at all. Um, mm -hmm. And figuring out that schedule becomes becomes like the minimum standard that is, you know, stamped on your application that you have to follow and that you're obligated to follow, uh, for, you know, in per perpetuity until you change it. Is that typically coming from revenue? Naturally. I mean, that's a, um, this is one of these very I mean, general questions. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're the first, uh, nonprofit I've worked with. Um, and so, it, but there's nothing on paper that says nonprofits can't be employed um, or can't be GI Bill certified. Um, I think it's actually a um, it, it's a it's a positive mark on your application, really. Um, I think uh, so. So I don't have the answer for you, but I don't really know if that it matters. What the only implication is that let's say you take an apprentice on, you run out of funding, and so now you can't pay them their wages anymore. I don't know what happens at the very at a very minimum they are disenrolled from the GI Bill benefits, but um, there could be you know additional implications for your status as a certified employer. So that's definitely a risk. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Yeah, well, that has the simple answer there. It has to come from revenue of what, what we're producing. So say we're building homes, things like that. Is the education route? So does that sound sound accurate? Uh, which part the the revenue? Well, the revenue from, it has to come from what we call now programmatic revenue. So the services we provide and we get paid for that. The mm -hmm. yeah the the wage would have to come from that naturally. I right? think so. Okay. Now in the education route, so are you saying that the conditions there are different? So at, in the education route, people don't get paid. Correct. Uh, under an education route, the money the VA pays uh, you. The tuition. Uh, the veteran also receives, and so th so this is another uh, slight nuance. Mm -hmm. If I'm a veteran, I go to school. The GI Bill pays my tuition, and I get a monthly housing allowance for as long as I'm in school, and it's proportional to how full time I am, mm -hmm. um, and it's based on zip code. Um, that's education. If I just do employment, I only receive the housing allowance, obviously, because there's no tuition to be paid. So in theory, the monetary value to the veteran of the of the education program is vastly higher in just dollar cents than if I only receive a housing allowance because I'm also getting tuition paid. Uh, however, you and I both know, um, you know, it, the, the monetary value of getting tuition paid doesn't translate to real life value. So, uh, so well, this I is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think Marchin, as we're writing our sibbers and we are selling into the, you know, the the kits and things like that, that will 
justify more the labor side. The, the education sounds more in line with what you're currently doing. Because his current model is people pay him uh, for, to attend an apprenticeship. Um, well, that's a part and of some, product sales. And, and a few of the products are selling, and we need to expand that. And that would be the situation where the labor would make sense is like, you know, for each one of the products, we could have dedicated folks. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think there's a world in which both, are, you know, possible we start both, you know, as soon as you say go um, to give you some context, the franchise fitness company that I, I was telling you about, they have something they call starting strength university in which people pay to attend to become coaches. And that's at a specific franchise location. And they have a currently in the works an apprenticeship pathway in which the people are employees of gyms. Now they are distributed across the country. They have, uh, you know, they're coaching for that credential is extremely demand. And so they can build into their financial model, franchise owners, uh, using profit sharing to subsidize apprentice wages initially, uh, but like just to give you an idea of like some of the creative ways in which yep. people solve these problems. How long does this process take? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, anywhere from two to six months uh, until you're GI Bill certified on the official list. Um, COVID has completely screwed up. I, I, with one particular application, I was in the process for two years. Uh, a part of that was because I didn't know what I was doing initially, and then COVID hit, and then, you know. Uh, but I, I, you know, <laughs> two, two to six months, it's the government. I'm doing my best. I think more success stories are giving me enough credibility where I can talk to people a little bit higher up the food chain. Um, yeah. So here's the deal that I see in the education world. The education is education slash research. And the biggest part to creating the next economy is the research and development to create open source products across the board. Uh, so I don't see the, the labor route getting the R&D part happening. I see the R&D part happening much more through the, like take, take your university, you do a project, you do your thesis, and, you, and that thesis is a development of a product of some sort like in business school or in engineering. So it'd be like engineering class, except you're doing things that are globally collaborative and then actual pro products that solve pressing world issues at the end of the day. So that's the part that's missing for me from the labor part. Is that an accurate assessment? I, I think so. No, 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 I, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, what, what we're talking about here is more of a binary problem. You're either GI Bill certified or you're not, but none of that uh, the the implications of that on how you craft the veteran or the the student experience or the entrepreneur experience, um, you know, are, are minimal because it, it's either you have access to this talent pool with incentives or you don't. So um, your internal workings of how you want to craft the program are unaffected. Um, it's simply a matter of, you know, which, which road will give us the most uh, 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 benefit in terms of fast GI Bill approval. And, you know, Jesse brought this up. I was hesitant to talk about it, you know, this early in the call because I don't know much about we'll it. Bring it on. There is contracting potential here in which, you know, you receive additional grant funding. He mentioned Department of Labor. I don't know exactly the extent of this. Um, but there is federal money out there uh, to help, you know, integrate organizations like yours into the transition assistance program. Um, so th that's another road we could go down. And honestly, I don't see any reason why we can't do both mm -hmm. applications. And you decide at the end which one you want to sign. Us. So just to get the, the story straight on the, so the labor versus education route, education is the sole difference is the education route you're getting paid tuition whereas in the labor part you're just getting room and board that's uh so the you're education getting... route, tu tuition and possibility of room and board but 
in the labor route is just the room and board. What's what's the clarity on the what assistance does the GI Bill yeah. for the labor route at the end of the day here? Right. And, okay. So so for the labor route, uh, the veteran will receive the wages they get from the an apprentice and a and monthly housing us. allowance. Right. That comes from you. And a monthly housing allowance, which is paid directly by the VA. Uh, okay. We call it a housing allowance because it's based on the zip code and cost of living. However, it's literally just cash. There's no no strings attached to that. Um, as an apprentice, and, and, and this is a nuance of it, but as the, the training program goes on, every six months, the the number, the, the numeric value of the housing allowance decreases 20% every six months. And that is designed to compensate for the fact that as they're gaining experience as an apprentice, their wages are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in principle, labor they get a salary from you and they get money from the va monthly just cash education is the va pays you the 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 school the tuition and you do with whatever you need to with that money to support your curriculum and the veteran receives the housing allowance the same cash payment they would that in that circumstance it does not decrease every six months uh, it remains constant based on zip code. The only thing that would change the monetary value of it is uh, if they have to go part time in a given month. Do you see room for longer term programs such as four year? Because uh, is this a question to ask at this time regarding this is now like the program in movement entrepreneurship. So this is higher level, like getting towards more like the PhD R&D level of this kind of work. Or is that a later phase? Are you talking about specifically with respect to veteran benefits? With respect to GI Bill for education. Um, I, I don't think, so So what that would entail uh, is Congress to change the blanket benefits that are currently a, a part of the post 11 GI Bill. So uh, what that, you know, right now, every veteran who's 100% eligible, which just means that you serve the basic amount of time, uh, is 36 months of benefits. Um, on top of that, if you go to most colleges, there's something called the Yellow Ribbon Program, which will make up the difference so that you don't have to pay anything out of pocket for a four-year degree. But it's, again, variance is really high on that. Um, in order to have a PhD level, uh, in terms of like anything longer than 36 months, what that would require is Congress to pass. Yeah. So... Um, it, so, essentially, what, what the existing program is, is every veteran, out of fairness, regardless of your service, rank, whatever, mm-hmm. has X amount of benefit that they okay. can use in whatever way they want. Bottom line is, okay, so it's 36 months. I thought it was like, you get your college tuition paid. I thought that was typically four, four years, I guess, only by the extension, you're saying. Well, it, it's, it's funny because the 36 months, like, they only charge you... Uh, or it, that only applies to academic months, right? So if you're if you're technically in school for four years, really you only went to class, you know, in the fall and spring semester. And so it's not counting the summers. And so it kind of works out where 36 months is actually equivalent of four years of, oh. you know, an undergraduate degree, right? But the reason why this is so tricky is because every institution rates credit hours differently. And this goes into sort of like more of the red tape of how, how the Department of Education, you know, accredits you know, one ABET program versus another that's not ABET accredited as an engineering school, for example, and, you know, what their credit hours are worth. Um, there's, I'm sure, rooms full of people that try and do the math on this. At the end of the day, from the veteran's perspective, they just see, oh, I received full BAH this month, or the housing loans. So I guess that means I was full time. And then in May, when classes end the second week, they're probably going to receive less housing allowance because it didn't count as a full Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. so pretty much a four-year degree, pretty much, okay. definitely. Um, explain, uh, so let's get the clarity on uh, in the G- GI Bill for labor for any employer. So what, what exactly is their advantage there? Because they could be getting somebody without GI Bill. However, there would be a pressure on that person that they have to have money for housing and like room and board. Like they pay in the GI Bill for labor, they pay you, is it just housing or, or like 
also like your food allowance or whatever anything else uh so so the veteran perspective i'll, I'll do the veteran and employer perspective the veteran yeah. perspective if i would do an apprenticeship that is gi bill certified um i'm happier because the va is paying me you know 12 to 1200 to 2000 dollars in cash a month on top of what i'm making on my apprenticeship um Whereas if I just did an hourly wage job, then I would just be receiving my hourly, hourly wage. Nice. Now the reason this is important for veterans is because they're, uh, you know, have a have a, a a network and you know skill gap coming from the military in that immediate short term, and yeah. so the extra cash up front to help subsidize my transition from the military is, is a huge incentive in terms of who I work for. And then you know obviously there's the benefit of this employer was conscientious enough to apply to this big federal program and is going to teach me a skill, which is the whole reason that they're yeah. eligible in the first place. So, so that's a very, from the employer perspective, the benefit is that you get to go to the veteran community and say all of the issues, and they never say it this way, but mm -hmm. my perspective is all of these issues that you're experiencing where you're, you're essentially institutionalized, you, have no idea what your options are. You've never applied to a job before. You don't know where you're going to live. You don't know how you pay for health care. I can help you solve that because I'm going to teach you a skill and bring you from military structure into some sort of education job combination structure, and you'll make more money. All I ask is that you show up with the right attitude. So, so from the employer perspective, it's increased access to talent, reduced payroll expenses those are the two main reasons why an employer sh you know in theory would want to and also to I, I see the hiring risk the just the initial vetting would you say that's also a strong point because has has the army done an initial point of vetting or we're we saying no this the, the vets are yeah could have same issues like anyone off the street okay so the, this is a much longer conversation i'll do my best to be brief um, there's no reason to expect a veteran is going to be uh, any better or worse than than a similar peer from the civilian community. Uh, what you do experience, however, is that the tails of the distribution are uh, much fatter and wider. So the best veteran that you find as a 22-year-old is going to be head and shoulders above the best civilian that you're going to find, you know, it, I'd be, I'd be hyperbolic here, but uh, they're going to understand accountability in a way that you, you know, that their peers can never could. They're going to They're going to have grit. They're going to, you know, be problem solvers. They're going to be leaders. They're going to be have values, right? Um, so that's that's the best side. Of perseverance, like that's the best side of the distribution. That's mm -hmm. really what you're targeting. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, on the other end of that are um, veterans who like showed up to the military with terrible coping skills, the military made it worse, and they had a bad trauma experience, mm. and, you know, they're kind of out on their own at the moment, and so now you get into things like suicide, substance abuse, homelessness. Mm. So, um, you know, the, there's not, you know, veteran, I call it the veteran paradox. Mm. Um, in a certain context, you see people do uh, superhuman things and in other contexts you know you watch them struggle to pay their rent mm -hmm. and it, that disconnect i'm still you know pulling mm -hmm. at those threads because it's really complex but um you know the value proposition of allies incorporated is essentially we're gonna we're gonna uh disentangle that paradox for you because we have a connection with the veteran community that any institution that talks at veterans about what they should be doing or how they're going to help them or give them free, you know, transition assistance. You know, what they they fail to see is that from a 22-year-old's perspective in the military, the last thing they want to do is deal with another institute or anything that looks like them. Um, so. Okay. And please stop me if I'm rambling. This no. is kind of my bread and butter. No, so... so in order to create the okay, that was when we were talking about the curriculum. You actually provided that service. Was that also for the the employer route, or were you focusing more right. on education? 
you know, the, the, they're very similar, the processes that we would go through. And, like, to be perfectly upfront, I've never done an education pathway, pri- you know, primarily because most of the employers I deal with haven't been around for longer than two years. Um, primary, sorry, because and they're not. Most of the employers that could potentially be eligible for education haven't been around for two years. Okay. Uh, okay, so on the housing part, uh, uh, housing part for the, the vets on the employment route, so if we provide housing on, um, are there any issues with that when we provide housing? Like what's, how do you determine the, the pay structure there, the just competitive market rate? Yeah, the, the only requirement I'm aware of is it has to be above federal minimum wage. No, no, but I'm saying um, I'm saying if we have housing on site that we provide, ah. part of it, if we're going to have 24 people on site year-round, we need to increase, build up a little more infrastructure as well here. Yeah. We can house some people already, and I was yeah. just inquiring how what's the typical practice for... What, what are those rates? How are those rates determined? Um, you, you're to, just to clarify, you're talking about the cash that the VA pays the veteran directly while they're an apprentice? Right. In or the the employment. Ha- right. So uh, I keep using housing allowance. It, it's, it's only a housing allowance in the sense that it's based on your zip code. So whatever zip code the, the physical location of OSE is, mm-hmm. um, that will set, and I can look it up right now if you want. That will set the monthly cash that they get, and then they can use it however they want. Okay. And how do, um, well, okay, let's go to the part. What would you say about, um, so say you're not so familiar with the with the education route. Are you, are you a sole person in the States that does this kind of work, or is there more of you? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of uh, companies that help employers find veterans and vice versa. I am the only one that does both that I've found. Um, it's me. You're looking at Outlaws Incorporated. Um, Sorry, both, meaning both education and labor? Sorry, meaning, meaning both. Meaning yeah, meaning serving a dual market, both employers and veterans. Oh, I see, I see. At the same time, yeah. Um, the the people I have run into that do this kind of work are all bureaucrats who do a very specific, narrow part of I it. I see, I see. And so, I, you know, I think, I think the accurate statement is um, I'm the only person I know of who is integrating institutions, wow. companies, veterans. And what made you choose to serve both the, the vet and the, the other side? Is that the integrated nature you're interested in? Because to me, that's actually never split the difference. That's the best deal for both. You have to look after both parties, not like uh, prejudiced yeah. for one side or the other. I like that. I mean, the, the short answer is that's what made sense to me. And I, I have zero pressure to scale. So I, I don't report to a board. Um, I have a roof over my head and my family is comfortable, uh, because my wife works full time. Um, and my, again, it just goes back to my mission. I, here to solve the problem. I think there's a lot of value to be unlocked, but you know, this is, I know for a fact this is going to be a multi-year process for me, you know, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you think it would make sense to, to start both or in a rollout here so you do one and then the other or because it sounds like both yeah. the attractive part for me on the edu part is the r d effort because because the the perennial problem here is okay you have to have a product and it takes time to develop so if we're just doing the employer route well where's our house yet well we're releasing that in a few months it's not here yet right so we better mitigate the risk of we're training people for what uh, well, if we're expecting them to work with us, I'd like that. Uh, or we can provide more generic skills. However, that wouldn't be the strong point of OSC because um, they're not going to get hired to talk about here, we're going to transform this and that industry. So, you see the point? Yeah. Yeah. I, look, I, I want you to be certified as an education institution. 
I think I think that makes the most sense. Um, I mean, like actually, even from a marketing standpoint, like mar- marketing standpoint mm-hmm. of how you communicate to the the narrow subset of people you want in your organization, you you want the people who are eager to learn, mm-hmm. who don't see the immediate step from the military to a job as a negative. So, um, I after this call, if you know you're okay with it, I'll do all the research I can, and then we'll schedule another call, and I can up you know brief you on what I've learned about uh, what you have to do as a, as an organization to get certified, whether or not I'm the best person to do it for you. Um, and look, I'm, I'll be involved as much as you want. Uh, if if I have to send you to an expert, I'll happily do that. Um, you know, you, I'll let you drive and yeah. lead in that sense. So. Well, maybe the curriculum part, that's that's necessary in whatever case. So maybe we can, how do we start progress on that? Uh, typically, it's me with a blank document mm-hmm. open, and you talk, and I just take notes. Uh, it sounds right. like you have some things, you know, on paper already. That's cool, too. But, you know, I like to do it fresh off of the head of the person who's going to be running it. Oh, we've got That's too sort of much. Like an A-B test. So it's basically distilling and translating. Sure. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So what? How do we move on that? Uh, do you want to? We, can we do those two things? You do some research on the edu, edu side, and we just get into the curriculum. I mean, that's that has to happen now. The curriculum part. There's a little bit of work happening. Yeah. So, like for example, David, like Brian, uh, David's work, uh, trying to connect more to the university side, but. That's that's consistent with. Uh, I mean, I'd like to have an integrated operation, like I I, I do envision OSC is a highly integrated operation, so we can teach. How, we're open sourcing enterprise across the board. Here's productive enterprises. Here's how you run institutions. Here's how you become a movement entrepreneur at the end of the day, kind of a deal. Um, but the curriculum, on the technical side, that stands no matter no matter what. So let's um, yeah. Start I, when yeah, absolutely yeah so uh next week is best for yeah. me um let's start it. let me pull up my calendar um uh, let's see i would it say was... fri- yeah. yeah friday before 1 p.m cst um is good otherwise i've got um do you have any evenings open because maybe try evening sure in, a, in the uh, meantime can... right now like right now this was lunch lunch time in a busy day Afterwards may be a good time. Uh, after five, five p.m. or later, if that works for you, CSD. What zone are you in? Uh, I'm I'm East Coast, East. so um, I would say. Six. <laughs> yeah. But I do my best to protect bath time and, and dinner time. But yeah. uh, six p.m. six p.m. Uh, EST. So, or uh, so, sorry, six p.m. CST is ideal for me if you want to do that. Yeah. Um, in that case, Tuesday Wednesday. through Friday are open. Wednesday. Send an invite, please. Uh, Brian, do you want to be on, in on that too, or are you just going to be mind your own business talking about? Uh, I don't know. I mean, do I need to be on there, or no, what do you this think? Is, this gets not not specifically. Uh, I think when we get this cranking, it's going to be going through a lot of detail probably right mm-hmm. brain dump. yeah I, i'm actually just noticing um is is it gonna be a problem if i actually push that a little bit later to uh 7 30 cst 7 30 cst um otherwise i'll have to switch wednesday i apologize okay uh switch what about thursday thursday works great 7 cst yep I'm doing a crazy time. I'm going to bed like 8 p.m., man. It's crazy. 8 to 4. Oh, that's great. That's, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's insane. I have to do it. Um, yeah. That kind of a schedule. So I'll be, I'll be the last, I'll be, I'll be how you clear your head before you go to bed, though. <laughs> yeah. No, this is, this kind of stuff, I, I dream about it. So, uh, no, I, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. This is really important. I'm excited it's happening. And no, uh, go really ahead good. and send me the invite if I can. I'll join. Yeah. You know, if not, no, I do really appreciate because I mean you're filling in a role. I mean, we, yeah, exactly what we need. So I'm glad you have this kind of integrated perspective. I do like it. Definite thing we need, and 
when we get it rolling, I think there's, yeah, we'll make it happen. And Great. Uh, um, change the world while we're at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't let you on this call without saying, like, I, I just love your vision. I, I, I'm so glad to find somebody that believes education isn't something that's done to you. Um, no, no. And so I just have so much admiration. And um, also, like, uh, you know, it, please keep in mind, I expect zero commitment. Uh, so if, if, if anything changes, and, and you, you know, I don't want you to feel tethered or obligated <laughs> in any way. So I want to be clear. I was going to say, well, I, I would like 100% commitment. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Hey, y'all. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Well, thanks. This is great. great to meet you. So, John, thanks so much. This is awesome. And thank you in advance to Jesse for making this happen. And Jesse's and Brian, too, because, Brian, you got you got me to Jesse in the first place. So, thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah. All right. All right. Invite on the way. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.